Amen. Amen. Well, hey guys, thanks again for being with us. Isn't that cool? All the worship stuff coming together. Can we give God some praise one more time? That's huge. Let's go. Well, hey, I am super pumped about today. Uh, if you were with us last week, we started a brand new series called He Is All. Uh, and in this series, we are talking about the fullness of Jesus, right? Uh, last week, we talked a little about his heart, a little bit about his nature as well, which we're going to continue that today. But the heart of Jesus and his heart to be full of grace and full of truth. Do you guys remember that last week? Uh, the latte message is what I call it, right? Josh made you a nice latte on the stage. And it was this picture of grace and truth and how we are enabled, right? We're, we're, we're not capable of, of, of obtaining 100% of both as human beings, but praise God, we have a Savior who is. He is 100% grace, 100% truth. And we looked at uh, the example of Jesus and the woman caught in adultery and how he, God comes in, he does this mastermind moment where he, you know, he, he, he tells the Pharisees some truth and he shows this woman some truth, but with so much grace and you know, go and sin no more and all this stuff, just this beautiful picture that only God himself could have painted, amen, that only he could have done. And so today we're going to continue in these uh, paradoxes, if you will, uh, of, of Jesus and this complexity that we see of him being completely uh, two things at once, multiple things at once, um, but being them to the max, being them completely, being them in, uh, in, in a whole way, and not just a mixture, not just one or the other, but the complexity in the best way uh, possible of Jesus. And so today we're going to talk about Jesus being fully God and fully man. We've probably heard this before. We've been in church a while. He is referred to as the Son of God and the Son of Man in Scripture, right? And it's like this, this duality there that oftentimes can be a little confusing. But we see in Scripture, and we're going to dig into this a little bit more just to bring some scriptural evidence to it, that He is fully God and He is fully man. He walked this earth as a human being without letting go of and without not having the powers of the divine of the Heavenly Father within Him, the capabilities of God being Him himself, right? It's the nature of Jesus, the dual nature of Jesus. So again, if, if, if you're like me, when you hear this, and if it's kind of new to you, it's confusing, right? This complex Jesus that we hear about, and we're like, dude, how does this work? Like the grace and truth thing, how is he able to, to completely obtain both of them? And there's been a lot of ideas and disagreements and different uh, theology ideas on how this actually works or what it looks like, um, but it can be complex. And if you're like me, when I see complex things, I kind of step back. You know what I'm saying? I get a little intimidated. I'm like, this is kind of hard to grasp. This is a little hard to figure out. So I'm going to step back and I just kind of scratch my head and go, I'm going to try to figure this out, you know? But it gets a little, a little weird. <laughs> and you step back and maybe for some of us, even discouraging. Here's a, here's a way to see it. Anybody in here a fan of board games? Okay. Come on, let's go, Gracie. I love board games. Okay. The Bustos family is huge. If you want to play board games, Hit me up, bro. Let's play some board games, you know? We'll have some fun. But we are training Liam and Ellie to like board games as well. And so we, I'll just tell you what, I have dominated at, you know, shoots and ladders, all this kind of stuff. We've, I've just, no mercy in our household, right? They're like, let's play this game. I'm like, all right. <laughs> you know, it's, they're learning Uno right now. And it's just like, man, skip, skip, you know, plus four, plus, it's bad. But anyways, we're playing these games with our kids. And one of the things about these games as you're teaching them is the games are pretty simple, right? It's like, hey, spin the dial, get a number, move that many spaces, you know, or lay the card, move that many spaces, do this one thing. Very simple games, really quick. What The more I play them, the more I'm like, okay, dude, I want something a little more, you know, like raise it up a little bit. And so Rachel and I have become very fond of this game called Settlers of Catan. Anybody know what that is? Come on. Let's go. I like that. More of you cheer for Catan than just board games in general, guys. Come on. Some of you might say Catan. You're wrong. It's Catan. No, I don't know. But we enjoy that game a lot. And we have friends who come over and they'll play that game with us and we've introduced it to them or, you know, my sister introduced it to us and we just, we love it. One of the things though, when we introduce it to new friends, is like, hey, let's play this game. We open the box and they're like, oh crap. There's so many pieces in this box, right? And I'm like, yeah, okay, so here's what you do. And I go on this 15-minute rant, and I explain, well, this card means that, and this piece does this, and you put this here, but you only do it if you do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're like, I think I'm good, dude. I don't want to play. You know what I mean? It's like, it's, it's so complex that it becomes discouraging. They're like, I'm straight. I'm not going to do this right now. Or I'm one of those people, if it's like a card game that's really intense, you're like, this card means this, and like, this card has nine different meanings. How do you even play this? You lost me at the title. You know what I mean? It's a very real thing. We have this tendency to lean into that. If something is too complex, we back away. A little discouraged, you know, a little frustrated, like, I don't understand this, and I just, I'm kind of done with it. 
We do this with Jesus. We do this with our Lord and Savior and this complex idea, fully man, fully God. It doesn't make sense. I have questions that are going unanswered that really want answers to, but really it's almost impossible to get them and it just doesn't make sense. And so I'm just going to step back, right? And we look at the complexity as a discouragement rather than something exciting, an invitation into a journey. We just got done in a series, uh, Messy Matrimony, we talked about relationships and, and marriages and even some singleness and dating and all that stuff. But when you look at marriages specifically, how many times do we find ourselves in the same spot with our spouse? How many of you guys think you know your spouse, like you know the back of your hand, right? It's like, yeah, come on, don't raise your hand, come on, right? Because the truth is we don't. Can I tell y'all, it was just a couple years ago, you know how much money I've spent on flowers? And then Rachel Bustos tells me, I don't like flowers. I'm like, could have been a whole scholarship fund or something for the kids, you know what I'm saying? Like that. It's not her fault, you know, she's just being sweet. But that was, I thought I knew her, right? And you have questions, you're like, dude, I thought I fully grasped who you were. And, you know, and sometimes we look at them and go, I don't know this person. I feel like I was learning and I don't. And there's so many more questions. And, and we get discouraged and we step away when instead what we should be doing is entering into that journey, Right? We should look at that and go, praise God, I get to spend every waking moment with this person learning more about them, growing, understanding more, right? Just like with the board game, I enter in and I learn and I play and I have fun and I grow and understand more. All of that is true with Jesus. Jesus invites us into this journey, this relationship with him where we will, church, we will have a lot of question marks and a lot of those question marks won't get answered, right? But it's hardest to teach us. His heart is to grow us, to, to give us understanding as we move forward with him. We should look at it as an exciting journey to follow Jesus on, not a discouraging and complex one. He's with us, showing us, revealing to us as we move forward. So this is what we're going to jump into today. We're going to jump into this complexity of Jesus as fully God and fully man, and how it is a beautiful thing, how it is a significant and impactful thing that we should want to follow into, that we should want to lean into, because I believe that he's got some ultimate big deal, life-changing things for us to see um, in his complexity of fully God and fully man. So to do this, what we're going to do is we're going to open our Bibles right now. If you've got your Bible, you can pull it out to Philippians chapter 2. It's going to be on the screen as well, uh, and then your phone or however you want to do it. Take some notes on this, uh, but we're going to go through Philippians 2, and we're going to be jumping around a little bit. So we'll go to Philippians 2. It's kind of like a base verse, and then we'll read some other scripture and go back to it for the next point, things like that. So stick with me, but this is the Apostle Paul talking. Um, in this section in Philippians 2, Paul gives this like poem, basically, okay? And it is seen as like this most beautiful representation of, of the gospel truth of Jesus Christ and what he did and how Jesus is the perfect example of humility and how he laid down his life, right, for us, being fully God, becoming fully man, and laying down his life to save every single one of us. Just this beautiful picture of the gospel of Jesus in this poetic way. And so we're going to read the beginning of it, verses 6 through 8, and get some points on this dual nature of Jesus. So uh, Philippians 2, verse 6, says, though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. So let's break this down, starting with verse 6, right? The point I want to talk about is the fact that he is fully God. Verse 6, though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Jesus was God, right? Jesus is God and is equal to the Father, right? Paul references it that there. He's got this equality with the Father that we'll talk about in a second that he decided not to cling to, to grasp to completely, but it's there. He is God himself, John, 1, uh, John chapter 1, Pastor Josh read this last week, but I want to reiterate it because it's so important to this point. It says, in the beginning, the word already existed. The word was with God and the word was God. This is Jesus, right? The word, the perfect representation of God's heart, his nature, his word to us. Jesus is it in the beginning, right? The word was with God. The word was God. He existed in the beginning with God, being him still. God created everything through him and nothing was created except through him. The word gave life to everything that was created and his life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness can never extinguish it. Amen. Jesus is God. He is equal to God. He is God himself. He is the alpha and the omega. He's always been a part of who God is and his plan. His authority is unending 
Uh, It's important for us to recognize that he was and is and always will be in control as the most high God. He's above it all, capable of it all. He is him, fully God, okay? So we got some scriptural evidence just with that. Next thing, this we're jumping back to Philippians 2. This is uh, coming from verse 7. So verse 7, instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being, okay? So we've got fully God in verse 6, and then he jumps into verse 7, and Paul brings about this concept that, hey, he's also a human being. We tell the story every single Christmas, right? Jesus was born, he experienced birth like all of us do, being born of a woman here on earth. That's exactly what Jesus went through, right? Again, not that that was the beginning of who Jesus was completely. He was with God. He is God from the very beginning. But he experienced birth just like we do. He experienced life just like we do. He was a kid who ran around. Maybe he needed a diaper change. I don't know, right? It's all these things. Jesus was a human being, and he lived life the same ways that we do. And not only that, but look at this, Hebrews 4, 14 through 15. So then, since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, Let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. Jesus was born like we were. He experienced life like we do, right? Jesus was tempted like we are tempted. You remember the story of Jesus in the desert, right? He was tempted like we are tempted, yet he was perfect. He did not cross the line of sin but he experienced life like we did. He experienced emotion and brokenness and loss and all these other things. He lived the daily lives that we lived, that people did then and there. And not to mention, but to add on top, right? He died just like every other human dies. We're going to talk about this in a few weeks and we're going to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ, amen? But we know that before the resurrection, there was death and there was pain there was brokenness and there was blood shed like a human bleeds. And that was Jesus who did that. That was Jesus who went through that for every single one of us. That was Jesus in the garden who sweat blood, asking, crying out to his father as we cry out to our heavenly father for a potential different way, a different cup to bear. Very real, very authentic, very human, but still fully God. Amen? Amen. Still fully divine. This crazy, crazy thing. So here's what this is known as, okay? So fully God, fully man, just to give you that, we've got a little bit of that scriptural evidence. This is known as hypostatic union, okay? That's right. We're using smart words now. Get ready. Hypostatic union, okay? So once again, fully both. So this, this phrase, this term, it comes from a council known as the Council of Chalcedon in 451 AD. I said Chalcedon first service, wrong. It's Chalcedon, maybe I'm wrong still, of, in, in 451 AD. So this, here's what happened. There's all these disagreements going on in the early church about this dual nature of Jesus, right? He's fully God, fully man. And people are like, there's no way a human being can carry the full divinity of God in himself or in herself. It just doesn't work, right? There's no chance. So there was disagreements on like, is he one or the other? Is he more of one? Is he a mixture? Is he the latte? It's like, what is he exactly? Because it doesn't make sense. And so these group of early church leaders came together and like, we've got to come to a place on this. We've got to come to the place and, and just state the facts of who Jesus is. And the place they came to is that Jesus Christ is fully God and fully man. He is not some of one and some of the other. He is completely, to the fullest extent, both. Here's what it said uh, at the council. Jesus Christ is to be acknowledged in two natures, inconfusedly, unchangeably, indivisibly, inseparably. It is who he is, period. That's it. He is fully God and fully man. That's the picture of the hypostatic union, right? He is the one who bridged the gaps, being both. He bridges the gap between humankind and the Father, between mankind and God. He is both of them. But why? And that's really what we're going to dig into right now. That's, that's the goal of today. It's like, okay, I've heard this before, Pastor Ricky. We, we've talked about him being fully God, fully man. Like I've heard it in Sunday school, all the things, and that's great. But really, what does this ultimately mean for me? As somebody who's interested in jumping in a relationship with Jesus, maybe, or somebody who's already in the relationship with Jesus, why should this be impactful and what should it ultimately mean for me? To answer that question, why was it Jesus needed to be both? We're going to look 
at a story with a man named Zacchaeus. Who in here has heard of Zacchaeus, right? Come on, the song is already coming. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, a wee little man was he. Come on, we're getting after it. We're going to read about Zacchaeus if you don't know who he is and give you some background. But I believe this moment with Zacchaeus can reveal huge significance into the answers to why Jesus was both, why he is fully God, fully man for us. So some background on this moment. Uh, This is coming from Luke 19, verses 5 through 9. And just so you know, this is actually, I really encourage you, go look at this and read the story again. But it's only found in the book of Luke, in the the gospel of Luke. And it's just such a great, uh, such a great moment of of Jesus just showing his nature, showing his heart for his people. Um, But what's going on is Jesus is, you know, he's going around. Jesus is is doing his ministry. He's traveling. He's spreading the news, doing miracles, all these things. And uh, he comes to the town of Jericho, right? And immediately as he enters the town of Jericho, um, there's people who have heard of him, heard he was coming in, a crowd gathers. And they just begin to follow Jesus through the town of Jericho. um, And they're like, oh, this guy does miracles. We want to learn about him. We want to see him. We want to to see if it's what's true. The savior of the world, the Messiah is what people are saying. Like, let's go see this dude for ourselves. So everybody's showing up. There was a man named Zacchaeus, uh, who also showed up that day. So a little bit about Zacchaeus is he is, uh, he is the uh, chief tax collector there. Uh, and so we've heard of tax collectors in scripture before, and they're not good dudes is what we've been told, right? Like not a lot of people like the tax collectors. Why? They take your money, right? And you're like, bro, we don't like you at all. You're just taking our money. And so Zacchaeus was not just a tax collector. He was the chief tax collector. Really a simple way to say that he, he manages all the other tax collectors, right? Like he's the top dog that the other ones answer to. And that means that he just gets his hands on more money. Scripture says that he was a rich man, right? He had some dough in his pockets, you know, and he wasn't afraid to back it up. So Zacchaeus was a rich man, but he was the chief tax collector. And ultimately what that meant is, again, not a lot of people liked him. Most people, if not all of them, just were not fans of him. So this crowd gathers and the news comes to Zacchaeus that Jesus is in in Jericho. And so Zacchaeus makes the choice to go out and to see Jesus. And I'll just, a little side point, I think that's a cool thing. Like there's this guy who's like in charge of other people, big dog. He's got, you know, he's got his money, his dough in his pockets. And yet he hears this idea or this, this, the news that Jesus is coming in. He's like, I'm going to go see this guy for myself. I just love that picture. Even the people who are up and people see in other positions of authority, he's like, I'm going to go and see this for myself. And so he does that. Again, Zacchaeus was a wee little man, right? A wee little man was he. The scripture says he was short in stature. He could not see over all the crowd. So he climbs a tree. He climbs up a tree to see Jesus. And he does that. And he sees Jesus walking by. And that's where we're going to pick up in Luke 19, verse 5. It says, when Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus in the tree and called him by name. Zacchaeus, he said, quick, come down. I must be a guest in your home today. Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. But the people were displeased. He, being Jesus, has gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. You see that we, we see this how many other times in scripture, right? As Jesus hangs out with the broken. Jesus hangs out with the sinners and people are not happy about it. So in this whole crowd of people, if we're being super honest, right? If we're looking and we're rating in the way that we do as human beings, they were probably people who were more worthy to spend time with Jesus, right? And yet he goes, Zacchaeus, the chief tax collector, take me to your house. I'm hungry, you know? Like, let's hang out. And people are like, are you kidding me? That guy sins so much. Just another interesting thing that we see in Jesus's nature. Verse eight, meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord. They're hanging out. They're having a meal together. Zacchaeus stands before the Lord after spending time with them and said, I will give half my wealth to the poor, Lord. And if I have cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. Jesus responded, salvation has come to this home today. For this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and save those who were lost. Amen. Amen. So what does this story of Zacchaeus have to do to our question, why both? First thing as to why both, Jesus being both brings salvation. Okay? Jesus being fully God, fully man, it brings salvation, just like we see here. We see in verse 9 and 10, it says, Jesus responded, salvation has come to this home today, for this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham, for the son of man came to seek and save those who are lost. The heart of Jesus, the heart of the Father through Jesus, was to come in and to save his people. He wants to spend eternity with us. He wants to free us from our sins. He wants us to spend time with him. He wants to be close to us. So he came in to save us. And we see Zacchaeus, 
right? He's got time with the Lord. He spends some time with Jesus and somehow he gets to this place and he's like, you know what? I'm going to give up half of my wealth. Again, a rich man is what scripture calls him. And he's like, you know what? I'm going to give up half of my wealth to the poor. And then on top of that, if there's anybody I've wronged, if I've done taxes, when I've stolen money from people, I'm going to repay them. But I'm just going to repay them an equal amount. I'm going to do it into a quadruple amount. I'm going to four times over give them money back. So if you do the math, and I'm not good at it, this man is willing to give up over half of his wealth, most of what he has accumulated as the chief tax collector, he's ready to get rid of it. He's done with it. How does that happen? He has a meal with Jesus and he's ready to go, here it all is. Because salvation has come to the house. Jesus himself has entered into this space and he's begun to, through conversation and connection and all this stuff, to begin to change the heart and the life of Zacchaeus. And Jesus sees that. And he calls it out and he says, this man is a true son of Abraham. And it's like Zacchaeus was a Jewish man, right? But in the eyes of all the other Jewish people, he's probably seen as a lowly, lowly, lowly Jewish person, right? Like not a good one. And yet Jesus comes in and goes, he is this. And it's not just because of the, the family he's a part of, his family tree, but because of his faith. This man's faith has shown that he is saved. This man's faith has revealed that his heart is different than it was before. Salvation has come to this house. Why both? Both because Jesus wants to bring salvation. He wants to come in and do the same things he did for Zacchaeus in us. He wants to bring salvation to us. Hebrews 5, verses 1 through 3, and we're going to go all the way to 9, but skip. It says, and this is a little background on a high priest, okay? And there's a point to Jesus in it. But every high priest is a man chosen to represent other people in their dealings with God, right? So God chooses a high priest on behalf of all of his people to come in and atone for the sins of his people, to get them in right standing with the Lord. He presents their gifts to God and offers sacrifices for, each, for their sins. And he is able to deal gently with ignorant and wayward people because he himself is subject to the same weaknesses. That is why he must offer sacrifices for his own sins as well as theirs. So God handpicks a high priest to lead his people to be, to go to God's presence on behalf of them to atone for sins, but it's somebody that he chose, that God picked himself, and God picked people who he knows, hey, you're a human being, and you're going to be in right standing with me, but I'm choosing you, and you've got to be gentle with these people who you would say are ignorant and wayward, because you too are a human being who sometimes is ignorant and wayward right? You too are a human being who has a mess. And so it would be wrong of you to come in as the high priest and to go, I'm above all these other people. No, no, no. You're still a human being. So what does this have to do with Jesus? In verse 80 says this, even though Jesus was God's son, he learned obedience from the things he suffered. In this way, God qualified him as a perfect high priest, and he became the source of eternal salvation for all those who obey him. You see, Jesus had to be fully man and fully God to save us. Nobody else could have. Jesus needed to be a human being so that he could come in and he could relate to the people of God. He can relate and be understanding to what we experience, right? God himself in his divine nature and in his holiness and his complete holiness, the gap of sin had separated us from him to where we could not have that connection anymore. And so Jesus comes in and he bridges the gap. Being fully human, he can connect with us. Being fully God himself, he can connect to the Father because he is a perfect human being, faultless, without sin. Do you see that, church? He bridged the gap for us. He became the perfect high priest. And he's experienced life like we have. He knows what we go through. He can relate to us and understands it. And because of the fact that he is completely both, only him being God and human, could be the source of eternal salvation. And he's willing, he was willing to step into it for us, to be the way to the Father, to a real relationship with the Father. And here's the even better news, is his heart wasn't just to come in and to save us, to bridge the gap, but Jesus also wanted to draw near. And that's the second point. He was both to save us and to draw near. So Jesus didn't just show up to Jericho and see Zacchaeus in the tree and go, hey, up there, little guy, <laughs> You're saved. You know what I mean? And just keep strolling along, right? No, no, no. He goes, hey, Zacchaeus. Never met this person in his entire life. Zacchaeus is like, did he just say my name? He sure did. Do you see the significance there? That the Savior knows his name. The Savior said, hey, Zacchaeus, 
I see you. And I already know that everybody else around here doesn't like you. I want to spend time with you. I want to get close to you. I want to go to your house. I want to have a meal. And I want to save you, but I want to be personal with you. I want to be near to you. Jesus came to be near to Zacchaeus, and the same is true for us. John 10, 2-4 says, But the one who enters through the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep recognize his voice and come to him. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. After he has gathered his own flock, he walks ahead of them, and they follow him because they know his voice. Jesus wants to be in such a relationship with us to where we recognize him for who he really is, that we know his voice, that we find comfort and trust in it because we are close to him. He doesn't just want to be a God who comes in to save us and has authority over life, says, hey, I'm God, I did this for you, now figure life out, get it out. He's like, no, 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 I want to be right here with you every single step of the way. And on top of that, just like he did for Zacchaeus, you may be the chief tax collector. You may have stolen from people. You may be somebody that people hate. But my love is not conditioned on any of that. Jesus' love for us is not based on how well we do, how, how bad we do, or what we have or have not done. It's simply on the fact that he just loves us. Loves us so much that he wants to save us and be close to us through that salvation. Be near to us. He's not just saying, he, or not just saving us to check the box and say, I'm God and I did what I was supposed to do. No, no, no. I want to be near to you. Jesus wants to draw near. So take all that, okay? And let's wrap it up. What, is the ultimate, what does this ultimately mean for me? What's the ultimate thing? Jesus wants to be our savior and our friend. Jesus wants to be your savior and he wants to be your friend. John 15, verses 13 through 15 says, Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends, right? Jesus is talking here to his disciples, to his followers. You are my friends if you do what I command. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. Jesus did what he did because he loves us. He loves us so much. He didn't want to just come up with this stuff and, and, and not bring us into it. He invites us into a relationship where he shares with us. He talks to us. He reveals plans to us. He leads us and guides us, but he knows that it's got to be personal. It's got to be close. And so that's exactly what he strives for as, we, as he enters a relationship with us and he seeks it and he calls us out like he did Zacchaeus. He's like, hey, I want to spend time with you. I want to conversate over meals with you. I want to connect with you in a way you've never connected with anybody before. It's what I want. It's his desire. Look at verse 7, back in Philippians 2, just to bounce back to that. It's the beginning of verse 7 says, Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. A lot of times there's, there's debate on whether or not uh, when Jesus became fully human, again, back to uh, the, the hydrostatic, it's people think that he no longer had the authority and the divinity of God within him, that he was just fully human being while here on earth, right? So we, we do not believe that. I believe that Jesus had the authority of, of all of heaven's armies. He had the power, the divinity of God within him the entire time, right? Basically, I believe Jesus chose to tie his hands behind his back. But at any moment, he, he could have called an army of angels to come down and pull him off the cross, right? But he chose not to. Chose not to. Why do you choose something? Because you want something. And what Jesus wanted was your heart. What Jesus wanted was a real, intimate relationship with you. He didn't want to just be your God. He didn't want to just be your Savior. He wants to be your friend. He wants to have the best friendship in the world with you. It matters to him more than anything and everything. So, <clears throat> Um, Rachel and I have two kids. She's not here anymore. I pointed at her, but she's not here. Um, we've got two kids, Liam and Ellie, and they're, they're great. You know, we love them so much. Um, one thing uh, that we're kind of stepping into is like, obviously they're growing up and, and Liam, my son, has hit like a, a space where, you know, he's a why kid, you know? It's like, I'm like, hey, this, that. And he's like, why? And I'm like, boy, you know? I said, what do you mean, why? <laughs> uh, and it's a real thing, right? And again, you know, I'm not going to get into all the parenting stuff right now, but it's just like, 
Rachel and I are raised in two different households, and I'll just say God has moved through my wife in amazing ways. God has used my wife to bring healing to me from things I experienced as a kiddo. He, God has used my wife to teach me things as a parent that it, it just it blows my mind how he moves and in the way that he does. But he's brought it into my life in an amazing way through Rachel. Um, <clears throat> and we, the thing is, we were both raised in different households when it comes to parenting, you know? And I, I've always, I was always raised in a way of just like, just truthfully, it was pretty aggressive and to, the, to an unhealthy extent of like, you just because I said so kind of deal, you know, and like, you just do it, and it's like, okay, yes, <laughs> you know, and uh, so I've, I struggle with anger sometimes and frustration, and so I bring that in to my kids, and, and with Liam lately, I've just gotten to this place where I'm like, dude, why can't you just get this right? You know what I'm saying? And I don't know if any other parent is there, come on, but it's like, you're, you tell your kid, do this, do it this way, be like this, exact opposite, <laughs> and it's like, dude, why, why are you not grasping this? Like, I, I had this idea that I should be able to come in as a parent and go, you should do this, and I could walk away, and he would have it figured out. But can we even do that in our walk with Jesus? Right? Does God come in and go, hey, you're my kid. Figure it out. See you on Judgment Day. Right? No, dude. He's like, hey, here's what I have for you. Let's figure this out together. I'm right here with you. I love you so much. I want to walk this out with you. And so, again, just through, through how God is teaching me through Rachel and other people, and, and we're just learning so much as parents. And one of the things that God has revealed to me as I was actually, Josh and I were talking about this message coming up, and um, it was just the fact that God is like, hey, I'm, the grace I give you, give to them. Give to your kids. My relationship with you, how I'm present with you as you're learning and growing, and you don't get things right, do that with them. Right? And it was a picture of all that we're talking about right now of, God is not just some big, perfect God up in the sky who, who, who our life is a race and he's at the beginning and says, here's what I want you to do. You want to, I want you to get to that finish line. Also, here's a self-help book called the Bible. Read it, study it, understand it. Again, see you on judgment day. It's like, no, 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 no. He said, all right, here's this, here's this, here's all these resources. Also, let's go. I'm right here with you every step of the race. And one day we'll get there and say, we did it. <laughs> he wants to be with us. It's close and it's personal and he walks with us as a father should, right? In the most intimate way possible at all. It's who he is. We get confused and think that he's far, but he's really close. And in reality, he cares about every step of our journey. And he wants us to do the same. He wants us to see it as not some complex thing that we're freaking out about and just have to get to the end of. He's like, hey, let's do this together. Let's experience it to the fullness together. I'm right here with you. So here's what I want to give you before we close out. For some of us, maybe we're in here and this, this concept, right? Jesus is savior and he's friend and it's what he wants to be to all of us. He doesn't want to be just an authoritative God and he doesn't want to be somebody who doesn't come in and also bring correction, right? Grace and truth, all the mix, all the things. He wants to be both for us. He wants to be close to us. For some of us, that's hard to grasp even after this conversation and it makes total sense. Maybe it always has been. And there's probably a lot of different things that stand in our way of being willing to give Jesus a chance. Because just like he was for Zacchaeus, Jesus is at the tree. He's at the bottom and he's waiting and saying, hey, I want to hang out with you. I want to have a meal with you. And for some of us, it's like, do I get down from that tree or not? Do I go and see him? Do, do I accept the invitation to bring him in to my world? There's a lot of reasons we might not. But I want to challenge you and encourage you. Receive Jesus like Zacchaeus did. And here's what I mean by that. Maybe for some of us, to receive Jesus, it means we have to seek him. We have to seek him with real effort. We have to get down from the tree. Maybe for some of us, we have to go and see for ourselves. There may be crowds. There may be, you know, the crowds may be bigger than we are. And it may, there may be a lot of different things in the way that want to keep us from being able to see the Savior. But maybe for us, we have to put in the effort. Maybe for us, we have to climb the tree. Maybe for some of us, to receive Jesus means humbling ourselves. We may be the rich man. We may have all the things. But maybe Jesus wants us to see that it's not worth it. That none of those things compare to the relationship with him. None of those things compare to his love for us. And so it's time for us to let go of them and see them just as things that will not last eternity. But their relationship with our Savior will be there forever. Maybe for some of us, receiving Jesus means that we have to understand that no matter how sinful or hated we are, he welcomes us. No matter what other people say about us, 
No matter what we say about ourselves, no matter what we've done, he wants to commune with us. That he wants to be as close as possible with every single one of us, just like he does the next person and the next person and the next person. Right? Face to face. Not grossed out or upset or frustrated with our sin or mad at us for it. Does he want better for us? Absolutely. But loves us right where we're at. Maybe for some of us, the thing that's been stopping us is not knowing that he really does know us. Just like he did for Zacchaeus, maybe for you to receive Jesus, you need to know that he calls you by name, that he knows your name. He knows your likes, your dislikes, your frustrations, your pain, your emotions. He, he understands you more than you'll ever understand yourself. And he wants to help you with all that you are, but he knows you. Maybe for some of us, we need to receive Jesus without delay. We need to stop, wait, stop waiting for the perfect moment. Stop waiting to get yourself all together and say, I'm finally ready. I've, I've, I've prepared myself and I'm, I feel like a good Christian, good enough to begin a relationship with Jesus. It's not, it's not how that works, right? It's not what the cross meant. The cross meant as you are. And he brings life change. Only he brings life change. Maybe for, for some of us, it means we're willing to let Jesus into the rest of our lives. We've given an illustration here before uh, of, of our house and our, li- our, our life being like a house. And, 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 you know, like Zacchaeus, maybe, it's like Jesus is like, let me hang out. And if, he, if I was Zacchaeus, I'm like, dude, I got to clean. You know what I mean? You can't come over yet. And Jesus is like, no, 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 the mess doesn't mess with me. Let me come in. And not just let me come into the, to the foyer, the entrance space, and the nice living room that you just vacuumed. Let's go into the living room. Let's go into the kitchen. Let's see the dishes in the sink. Maybe for us, we need to let Jesus into the other spaces, really surrender, let him have it all. And last but not least, maybe for us, receiving Jesus looks like repentance and restitution, right? Half my wealth, Lord, and even more, four times what I've done people wrong, God. Maybe for us, some things have to change. And it's time for us to go, okay, I lay my weapons down. I lay my defense down, Jesus. Have your way. Change me. Get rid of the things that are that, that in me that are not good. Create a clean heart in me, oh God. Make me who you want me to be. Things that I want that are not good for me, make them things I no longer want, God. Things that are hurting me and not helping me, God, take them away. Make me who you've called me to be. I repent, Lord. We all have our reasons. But ultimately, the challenge is to give Jesus a chance to show you his heart to be your savior and your friend and how he chose to do what he did because he loves us so much. Amen, church? You guys want to stand? We're going to pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to gather as a family, God, to dig into your word. Lord, to learn more about you, God, in your nature. And you are you are big, God. Bigger than we'll ever understand, Lord. It's just, it's the reality of it, Lord. And, and that's okay. Because at the same time, you're revealing more of who you are to us, Jesus. And we can look to you, Jesus, to see the nature of the Father. So Lord, I pray that as we do this, Lord, and as things get complex, that we don't get discouraged. We don't step away, God. But we lean into the adventure of who you are, Jesus. That we trust that you didn't just come to save us, Lord. That you aren't just the one to make a way, God, but you're right there with us. That your heart's desire is to be close. It's all about this relationship with you. Let us choose that, God. Let us take whatever step is necessary, like Zacchaeus, Lord, to get down from the tree, to seek you, Lord, to invite you in so that we can be in this relationship with you, so we can be saved by you, God, so we can call you friend. We love you, we praise you, and we thank you. It's in Jesus' perfect name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Amen.